All right, guys, oral sessions. Joined today by the one, the only WWE Hall of Famer, my girl, Beth Phoenix. What up? I'm fist bumping through the screen. Fist yes. bumping, fist bumping, and waving. I'm just really looking forward to having you on the show today. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, I'm so excited too. Like, I feel like our friendship got to really blossom, you know, the. When, when we got to share that role together and learning that's the commentary stuff. But I'll always remember like Natty kind of, Natty mentioning this new girl, Renee, like to me, cause I had already retired. I had seen you a couple of times, but I was pretty much out of WWE at that point. Yeah. And then I met you and I was like, oh, like if Natty said you're cool, I know you're cool. So Well, it's it also like-, like the Canadian connection. You have a bit of a soft spot for us Canadians. Here we I are. know. I don't know. I don't know where that came from that thing, but like somehow I just surrounded myself in this wall of white and red that I love so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, Buffalo's close enough. I feel like Buffalo pretty much counts. It's a natural fit. Yeah. I'm often yeah, mistaken for Canadian and I'm okay. <laughs> well, it's funny because I feel like, I mean, with me not doing commentary now and not working with WWE, I still get tagged and stuff. I'm like, man, you and Beth sound the same on commentary. I'm like, yeah, I guess we have like that same kind of almost like regional dialect that like we would we would sound kind of the same or we're, we're only a couple hours apart from each other where we grew up yeah I feel like sometimes I can have a little bit more of a western New York twang like sure. for like for example like you know Wade is there with me and and Stu has like obviously this very proper British accent and he'll and it's really visible in the word gargano because he'll say gargano <laughs> and I'll be like gargano and like <laughs> just you can see it's just it's just but it's so interesting you know like I do feel like also you and I came kind of side by side at the same time sure and it was really like um it was different to have a female voice and I think sometimes that's why like they made us so relatable because they just weren't worse, used to hearing any females on right. in that role so yeah. they're just like oh of course it's the same person and they're both blonde it's the same person <laughs> <laughs> yeah I feel like people even see us on camera and think that we were the same person it's like guys we're both just two like white blonde women like yeah 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 and then throw natty into take the, it. Too, and the yeah. three of us like <laughs> there's some relation here something going on something is happening something <laughs> is in the water we've we've all consumed it i'll take it though i mean it's, it's a good group to be lumped into yes yes um, your documentary when it came out what was your reaction to being able to see that and getting ready to share all of, I mean, your entire journey. And I mean, even before, just before I let you even answer, I mean, I was watching that. And I don't know if it's like my pregnancy hormones or whatever, but I was like tearing up so many different times. Of just, like, well, just like seeing like a woman doing what you, what you've been able to accomplish. I mean, from like joining the wrestling team and then making your way through WWE, like just that perseverance that you had. I was like, Oh, I hope that my daughter has that. Like it's, it's, it was so cool. How, how did you feel watching it? Well, first of all, the hormone thing is real because having children completely ruined my tough guy image. It's gone. I cry when I like see a diaper commercial. It's really bad. So that will Let continue. It all out. Let those emotions <laughs> fly. Yes. And second, it was, it was really kind of like, I was really anxious about it and nervous because you know, it's, it was always easy for me. Cause I kind of had like self-esteem issues growing up. It was always easy for me to put on the wrestling tights and pretend to be somebody that I wasn't, mm-hmm. but I was always insecure about the person that I was. So like, I got to be a part of Adam's documentary. I've commented on other people's documentaries. Like I, I, I love talking about other people, but it was a, a, a real level of discomfort for me to talk about myself and kind of pull the veil back and show my family and everything. And just like, I I'm so protective of people. Like, you know how wonderful social media can be sometimes. And I just didn't want any, I didn't want anybody to experience some of the negativity that we deal with on a daily basis, but I, I haven't encountered a lot of that since the documentary came out. I feel like everybody kind of sees us for what we is, what we is. They pay me to speak on WWE. It's fine. It's fine. Who cares? Mommy brain also is a real thing, (laughs) but, um, yeah, I feel like people see my family, like we're, we're a small tight family and, um, and ever, you know, I had such great support trying to get into this crazy dream of mine and, and my, my little posse has remained tight. And, and so I was really proud to put that out there because also, you know, Adam and I've talked about this. We had a lot of hesitancy with showing the children as much yeah. as we have. We've, yeah. we're, we're a little protective about their image being put out there. We just don't want them to feel the pressure of having one public figure as a parent, let alone two. Yeah. So we're, we're cautious about that, but we felt like, you know, this is kind of a time capsule for them and a, a little taste of like where they came from and who their parents are, which I would have died to have. I would have yeah. loved to know my parents, like 
they'll get to know us intimately from a lot of these WWE projects. So we, we felt like it was a good balance of like sharing who we really are without like, you know, overexposing, I guess. That's, it's funny. Cause I mean, I feel like I'm spending a lot of time thinking about that now of like, what, like, where do you draw the line on what you show your kids? Cause I know it's gotta be like almost that knee jerk reaction of like, everybody look at this person I've made that I'm yes. obsessed with, but then also like protecting them and be like, also stay away from my children forever, please. <laughs> well, you know, it's a real, I think it's a real personal decision. And I think like the, 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 I, again, here's some unsolicited advice. This happens a lot too between Bring moms. It. Bring it. What I feel, what I personally feel what's worked for us is like, again, it's a real personal decision for us, what, what we put out there, but also like the, our kids are going to grow up in this, like this social media, like how, everything's out there. Right. So we got to empower them and teach them what it is rather than try to keep them in a bubble because that doesn't work either. At some point they're going to be grown ups and they're going to be you know, navigating their own life. And it would be a disservice to them to be like, this doesn't exist. Everybody's right. nice out there, you know? So I yeah. feel like, I feel like there's a happy medium in there somewhere. And now as our kids are kind of getting to the age where they're really little people and not babies anymore, we're starting to see how to do that as we go. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm going to have to navigate those waters as I go too. Cause I mean, as much as John and I can be like, we're going, this is what we want to do plans change, ideas change, situations change. So all you can do is kind of like roll with the punches and figure it out and do your best. Well, and what's neat, I feel like is like you grow just as much as the kids do. Like right. I am not the same person that I was eight years ago when I got pregnant, you know, like mm -hmm. you, you just, you, you become an entirely different person and it's really cool. And you just, I feel like the things that used to be a big deal suddenly become in perspective. So yeah. it's, it's a cool journey to have kids. And it's crazy. Um, so <laughs> buckle up. Um, before we move on from the documentary, um, your mom in the documentary and your brother in the documentary, your mom is a stone cold fox. You oh, really come stop. from some like great jeans. She was on. I was like, look at Beth's mom go. Were they nervous to be a part of it? How did they feel about oh, it? Oh, terrified. You know, like <laughs> they've never been on, never been on camera. They, and again, they watch me from afar through like a lens. Like, it's like, they wouldn't watch me and be like, wow, what a great match. You really had me enthralled. They'd watch and be like, oh, did you break your arm? Are you okay? Was that real? Like, did you bust a tooth? You know, like yeah. they watch through a different lens. They love wrestling. My brother and I grew up loving wrestling, but he loves me a lot more than he loves wrestling. So it, it's, there's a, there's a level of like fear that now I understand as a, as a new wrestling wife, because Adam returned to wrestling after, yeah. you know, we got together. So now I'm, I, I understand that fear a lot more of watching somebody that you love so much kind of be put in harm's way. And I know you understand that on many levels. As well. It's the worst. It is the worst. Like I always hear about like, you know, significant others that maybe have like a, a, a signal that they'll give to each other on camera or something to like, let them know that they're okay. I'm like, I got to loop John in on that. Cause sometimes I'm sitting at home and I'm like, you've got to be me right now. Like, tell me that you're okay. And, you know, it's not like John chose like the grappling side of wrestling. Like, right. he's like, Let, let's blow me up. Why not? Oh you know, my let's, God. let's add some C4 and some blood into this mix. Honestly, like, thank God that explosion didn't work. I was like bracing for it. I'm like, no, no, no. And then it didn't happen. I was like, oh, now I feel bad for you. But also thank God you're okay. Yes. Yes. There's a mix of emotions. It's, yeah. Walking it's, the line. I, yeah. I <laughs> um, and then also in the documentary, I mean, I, I knew the story about Molly Holly uh, paying for your wrestling school, but I didn't really understand the extent of it about yeah. just, I mean, even you meeting her at like a fan access, giving her your tape. And I mean, you always hear these kind of like horror stories of like women not helping each other in the business and stuff and like that is just not the case. I mean, obviously you look, I mean, it can be, but in this situation, you know, being able to see Molly Holly for her to see something in you right from the jump to help you get your foot in the door, to help pay for your wrestling training. Like that just doesn't happen. That's crazy. Well, and I, I feel like you hit the nail on the head right there. It's a matter of like, you know, what's the type of story that really grabs a headline? It's like, you know, so-and-so was catty and held this person down and like, yeah. blah, blah, blah. You know, the real, everyone wants the drama and it's not necessarily head, headline news to be like, no, this person is like a, a living angel. And she <laughs> plucked a, a basically a, essentially a fan. And I sucked at that time. Like I'm, the match that I gave her, I was not good, but Molly, like just saw in me, you know, just, I guess maybe a passion and commitment and just mm -hmm. want and a, a desire to improve. 
And that's what she gave me, like the opportunity to be able to improve when I did, wasn't financially in the situation. I couldn't have made that happen. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like those stories, there was a time where maybe those stories wouldn't get the traction, but I'm so proud to tell those stories because I feel like the more we normalize that, the more you're going to see that it's not a bunch of drama and cattiness. There, there is a lot of folks helping out each other. And there's a lot of men that help the women too. It wasn't yes. all like the men are holding us down and blah, blah, blah. There were so many advocates for the women to, to be better and to, to get more opportunities. Fit Finley, you know, Dustin, there's so many guys fighting for us and taking us aside and helping. It's not, it was not, it wasn't the, um, I don't know. It just wasn't all the way it was always painted out to be, if yeah. that makes sense. No, I get that. It's funny because I feel like, you know, when I do interviews and people always kind of want that, what's it like being a woman working in a man's world? And it's like, sure, there could be some hiccups and some like things that happen here or there, but that's going to happen regardless of gender. But I, you know, a thing that I always try to point out is how many awesome men that I've actually had the chance to work with that have done nothing but champion me and help me to get in the positions that I've been in and not made me feel like I was the girl to be there. I mean, I can talk about Michael Cole for days about how much he's helped me. I'm sure you can feel the same way, but like working with him, uh, you know, with, with Corey Graves, with, with Tom Phillips, with Mike Mansuri, like all of these dudes that have been so quintessential in helping to like push women along. But yeah, it, it becomes that headline of like, oh, they wanted to hold the women down and they're not doing right by them. And it's like, that's just, that's not always the case. Mm -mm. No, and, and, it's, and we know that it's not, it's not all like, you know, one side of the line, the other side of the line. It's, it's really a spectrum across the board. And, and we're all, we're all just a group. And we're all so different. Like there's just so many different types of people that get, get into this and are attracted to this. But now I just, I don't know. I, I don't prescribe to that theory that, you know, that, that it was all one certain way. <laughs> It's I'm trying to be politically here. correct. Can you tell? Yeah. Like, I, <laughs> how do I say it? We're walking that PC line over here. Uh, it's terrible. Uh, how did it feel for you to see Molly Holly going to Hall of Fame this year? Oh, I was so excited. So here's the thing. Like in my documentary, they didn't end up using the footage, but I shamelessly was trolling through that documentary. Like I was showing things that Molly gave me or whatever. And like, here's the gear she gave me. And I was like, future Hall of Famer, Molly Holly, gotta go in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> and then like, just randomly, because I knew it was about that time and we didn't hear any names announced for Hall of Fame. I was like, I said like, Victoria, uh, Jazz and um, Molly need to go in the Hall of Fame, like on Twitter. And word of no lie, like the very next morning they announced, and I think that they had already recorded the bump telling Molly. So I didn't know, I had no idea. Uh -huh. And uh, so I was so excited. Like I was just trying to speak it into existence. Sometimes like reminding everybody helps in like, oh yeah, holy crap. Like this person, how have we not, you know, highlighted this person yet? And I, and I think like, it's, it's, it's awesome to see people get their due that not, are not only talented in the ring, have helped a lot of folks, but also, you know, just like Molly just done so much behind the scenes is so treasured and respected. And, you know, I think we're, we're at a stage now where like being a good person is being rewarded. And I Thank think that's God. awesome. Thank God. About time. Right? Like it is about time. It's funny. I like, as I was like preparing to just interview with you and like one thing that popped in my mind, that's like something that I think you and I share, and I don't know if this has ever been something that's hindered you, but do you feel like being as nice as you are has ever gotten in your way? Well, I think that it got in my way when I was trying to be sexy. Like, okay. so, you know, there was a large segment of my career where I was kind of, I was competing with the brand of sexuality that we were putting forward. And it was so not me to the point where like, you know, I got breast implants, something, a decision I was really uncomfortable with, but I felt like that was something I had to do because I was just this, I wasn't that type of woman that like exuded sexuality. And I felt like, well, if I don't do this, like how, I mean, I didn't feel like nobody ever said that to me, mm -hmm. but I felt like that would bring that out of me. And it didn't at all. It made me more self-conscious and, yeah. and, you know, so I, I felt like I was constantly competing with myself to like be this thing that I wasn't. And um, yeah. And it, it just being nice. I don't feel like held me back because um, I felt like I wanted, I treated everybody with respect. And honestly, here's another Molly Holly story before my very first tryout at the air Canada center in Toronto, yes. ooh, ooh, I was ooh. going as an extra in 2002 and Molly was kind of giving me all the answers to the test. And then the first thing she told me was when you walk in that door, shake every person's hand, crew, catering, you know, janitorial to Vince McMahon, everybody's the same, treat everybody the same. And I was like, yes, ma'am. Yes. You know, like that, that lived with me forever. And so I feel like 
I feel like that was one thing I tried to keep true in my career is like, I didn't care who you were. I don't care if you came in and your ish didn't stink, like, you know, it, or you were somebody that was, you know, setting up the catering for all the wrestlers. Like you're the same to me. And we, and I think like in that way, that, that type of attitude has, has gotten folks farther than the other side. I completely agree. I mean, especially when you look at the amount of time that we all spend together when we're on the road, it's like, how could you differentiate yourself from all these people that are also getting on these same flights that are also away from their families that are also like chasing their own dream, even though it could be different from the, you know, the goal that you have in mind of being on camera and being a wrestler, but everyone's still putting in all this work. And I mean, yeah, I mean, there can be some like thankless jobs out there. That's like taking the time to just like say, Hey, to people and have those conversations, like be a human. That's, yeah. That's the way to go. And I mean, it's, it's, we're all in this cause it's the rock and roll life. Like yeah. now we're not really traveling, but it, you know, for, for the most part, we got into this to live this rock lifestyle and see the world and meet cool people and do cool things that superheroes do, you know? So yeah. we all have that common thread and we're all contributing to the show. Like every, if, if one person drops the ball, it, it ain't good. So yeah. it all, all there. Okay. So 2012, when you walked away from, from wrestling, and I mean, I know this is uh, you know, could be somewhat contrary to what we were just saying about being championed by men and having all these people behind us. Again, there are both sides to both to, to each story, but you walked away in 2012. You were just done with wrestling at that point. How did you come to that conclusion? So, you know, I felt, and I'll be transparent on this, you know, I would go on the live events and I'd wrestle, wrestle my ass off, you know, 12, 15 minute matches, like, and I felt like they were great matches. And I, I felt that way because my peers would say that to me, I'd be like, you guys killed it tonight. Good job. And, and I would listen to the audience and like the audience is reacting to us on the live events. Even if I come out to crickets because I've had no TV time. Once I get the chance to tell the story in the ring for 10 or 15 minutes, by the end, everybody's excited. Yeah. So I knew that I was doing the job right. And I knew my peers were telling me I was doing the job right. But then I would go to TV and here's, you know, here's a match that's supposed to happen and it's cut to 30 seconds. And I felt like a real dispensable part of the show, no matter how long and hard I'd worked. You know, I felt like even at a point, like I got over as a character, you know, I thought I did that part right. Mm -hmm. I thought I checked every box to be, trying to move this thing forward. I felt like, you know, I was trying to work with other women to, you know, as a, as a group too, to try to get us all, you know, featured more. And on every, I had pay-per-view matches, every pay-per-view for like five years. And then I remember like one of those last years and I'm like, oh, here, here I am. And I would work like, or do a tag match on the weekend and then be taken out of the tag match and somebody else plugged in on raw. And I just got to the point where I was like, oh. I'm, you know, I felt so frustrated that I put in all this work and I didn't see anything changing in front of me. And at that point I was like, well, I'm 31, I'm 32. And I had already wrapped my head around, like I had bought a house. I'd set up this really manageable life that would not require me to make a wrestler's salary in order to keep the lights on. I was living near my family and friends and I was totally ready to just move on because also I done everything I worked, I accomplished all the things that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And even if on the grand scheme, if it didn't matter, and if people were like, I don't even remember you as a wrestler, I was like, well, I remember what I did and I tried really hard. So I was ready to move on. And then, you know, I'm, I'm in this whole conversation in my head, getting ready to leave. And then Adam and I got together. And then the other layer on that is like, he was, you know, done with wrestling and grieving that and ready to move on too. So we were like, well, let's, let's, it's time. It's family time. Like, right. Yeah. Like make some and, do the horizontal make shuffle, some, brother. Let's yeah. go. Yeah, you're, you're hot. Let's do this thing. So, so, you know, it just kind of, it really, and then he had his neck surgery. So we, we had just suddenly both ended up sitting on the couch next to each other with, you know, all this stuff behind us. So we were just ready to like throw ourselves into parenthood. And we did like full on just dive right in. He was doing the acting, but I was like, I'm stay at home mom for life. I love this. I was so happy that, I mean, I can imagine and then to have everything kind of flip upside down again now to like, okay, so Adam's now back in WWE, you're back in WWE. Um, what was that like for you being, uh, you know, the wife watching him get this dream back? I mean, we talk about this a lot, like, 
like the documentary shows a little bit of it and you know what what you see on the screen is like two percent of it <laughs> but it's it's been years and years and years of the work that he's put in like pretty much since 2018 you know like trying to get himself physically and mentally ready to do this but me as a wife like it it, it has been jarring it has been difficult mm -hmm. because I had for almost 10 years wrapped my head around the fact that like if he gets in a car accident he could die if he, you know, falls the wrong way, he could die. Like we were told all these things that really made me terrified for Adam to be in a dangerous situation. Even mountain biking, I was nervous and uncomfortable. I just didn't want, you know, I, I love him. I don't want anything to happen to him. Mm -hmm. So then when he starts contemplating this wrestling thing, I'm like, are you nuts? Like maybe we should go to the psychiatrist instead of like Dr. Maroon. But he just, he just knew himself. Like he knew himself, he knew his body and he knew himself more than I did. Mm -hmm. And he knew that he knew that there was a window open for himself. And then once I said, there's two things I need to see before any of this can happen. And I said, this is as your wife. And I will, I will be the big heavy on this and say, no, because we have two kids. I said, I got to see it with my own eyes, number one. And then I have to hear it from the best in the world. I have to hear from Dr. Maroon, I have to hear from our team that you will be okay. And I have to see it. I have to see you move around and see it with my own eyes to, to be convinced that this is real. And he did both. So what can I do, Renee? <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> All right. You've met the criteria. I guess we'll proceed as yes. normal. Yeah. Crazy. And I mean, to be able to see him come back, come back now, and then he suffered another injury, had a bit more time out. You've been busy with commentary. And to see Christian now also medically cleared and back in a ring after seven years, no what? bumps thinking like, what the hell? Yeah. I, you took the words out of my mouth. What the hell? So like, it was just, it was as casual as when it happened with Adam, you know, they just started kind of casually talking about it. And then I think Jay was doing the same processing that, you know, Adam did on his own. And, mm -hmm. and the cool thing is like, they've leaned on each other so much throughout all of this. They have each other. It's the neatest story. Like I tell them all the time, like, this is a movie. 100%. Like you guys, you guys have lived this friendship since sixth grade, since you were kids. And how many, I mean, a lot of us have made friends in wrestling, but they're truly like the story, like the, the Hardy boys were brothers, like, yeah. you know, other than brothers getting into this. Like they're, they're the closest thing where best friends just dreamed it and made it happen and then made it happen again. So I just, I love their friendship so much. And I love that they just bicker with each other too. <laughs> that I know I'm have, always, sorry, it, it must've been like interesting conversations for them. Cause I mean, I know John and I had been talking to Jay a lot as he was trying to figure out his decision of what he wanted to do, showing up in the Royal Rumble. And then obviously talking to Adam, trying to figure out what he wanted to do. So, I mean, to be a fly on the wall for those conversations of them trying to figure out what the best move was for Jay to do. I mean- Come on, but it is yeah. a movie. it's a movie. Now they're both working for rival companies and like, someone's got to write this. Somebody listen to this, write this script. So my question to you is seeing, seeing Adam back in the ring, seeing Jay back in the ring, you're back ingratiated with WWE. And it seems to me that literally every woman that I talk to <laughs> is like, I want that Beth Phoenix match. Aww. And you are medically cleared, correct? I am. Renee's trying to get me booked, everybody. Do you see this? <laughs> Just, I know that you, I mean, you're a wrestler. You are fantastic at commentary and that will be a job that you will be able to do forever. But there's got to be part of you that is still a little bit like, oh, let me put on my boots and get back in there. Do you think about that a lot? So, yeah, I mean, once a wrestler, always a wrestler. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie about it and be like, oh no, no, like I'm good. You know, there's, I feel like you wouldn't have, you couldn't have done this and wanted to do this your whole life without always having that little bug, mm -hmm. you know? So I get, and I also, I just get so happy to be in the conversation of somebody that, that our today's stars would look forward to facing. Like, again, when I left WWE, I felt really insignificant and I felt like I hadn't done anything. I just felt like I didn't move the needle and I felt so, you know, I felt sad about that part, but okay. To move on but now i feel like I, i'm getting this wonderful recognition from today's women and it, it just makes me feel so good um as far as coming back to the ring <laughs> i always 
you know, I'm going to give the worst. I say this on every interview. It's like, you never say never if the right opportunity arose and I could do business. That's really all I would care about because of course, would I love to have a retirement match a, a, you know, a, a big farewell and give somebody the high five and pass the torch. Heck yes. Um, but I feel like I, there's only a limited amount of people I could do that for. Whereas on commentary, I can do that two hours every single week. Every, every week I can tell you how awesome Indy Hartwell is and tell you, you know, like look at Shotzi Blackheart's improvements. And like, I can, I can bring, I can help all the talent weekly on commentary. So in that respect, like I love, I love commentary because I feel like I'm contributing in a positive way, but it, the, the in-ring stuff, like, you know, I don't, I don't know what the future brings. I, I don't write off anything. I don't close any doors. If there were ever something that WWE be interested in doing, I would love to say goodbye. And like I said, and high, and, and high five somebody and give them an endorsement from a hall of famer who wants to retire a hall of fame. Come on, right. <laughs> put her away. Someone's got to you know, do it. Somebody put the nail in the coffin. It's too wrong. <laughs> when you see all these names rattled off and you know, anyone that's doing uh, media leading up to WrestleMania or whatever. I mean, whether it's a Rhea Ripley or you hear from like a Bailey, a Becky, a Charlotte, uh, to all of these women that are coming up, Raquel, uh, who, who do you want to face? Who would you want that match to be with? If you could pick right now, I am putting you on the spot. Nay, I, I have to stop. I, it's bad. <laughs> Don't because we're like it's manifesting be it. Well, and the clickbait, I can just see it now. Beth Phoenix challenges so-and-so like, <laughs> God hell maybe I mean, Vince will read it we'll get you book sister <laughs> get me book bro get me book. um I don't know like so what I love seeing like I don't know we had a moment on NXT last week where you had Bianca Belair you had Rhea Ripley and Raquel Gonzalez all three yeah. champions like is there ever a better visual of like a new era new you know fresh blood at the front of the line three hungry women that are just you know, we've got diversity right in front of us that we've been waiting for. And, you know, it was just such a beautiful snapshot. And I also love, like, we have so much body diversity across, you know, all the brands, like, which is a huge change for the women. We have women's tag team titles now because we have so many in-ring, you know, talented women that now you have those opportunities. And do you see how I'm like going around your question here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're a pro. You've been here and done that. I get it. <laughs> yes. But uh, there, I, I have a feeling there is somebody that uh I, I have a feeling there is somebody that um that will end up across the ring for me at some point and i i don't want to give any clues on that but uh, i i don't think that the beth phoenix is done lacing up the boots forever so you're screwing the issue of getting back in the ring but here's one other thing i just want to add is that i don't think this needs to even be just one match to like send off the hall of famer because you you're you're ready to go i mean you could May. actually have a window of having a run here. And I do feel like there's gotta be a part of you that just really wants to be a part of this women's division, looking at how much it has grown and changed. Can I, does everybody hear this woman? What a little naughty doggy she's being right now. She's booking, not only booking me for a match, but booking me for a run. I'm booking you for a run, girl. <laughs> this isn't a one-off, hell no. Oh, you know what? Like, I don't know. Right now, right now with Adam's current position, I have been in a supportive role and fortunately it's helpful for him to have a wife that he can body slam. So I've Very been in the ring and kind of pouring my energy into that. I do have some personal goals and I, you know, I, I know that the time is ticking on that stuff. Um, but the, you know, there's, there's little conversations had here and there. Good. I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave those little pennies in the bank. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Okay. So we'll leave that where it is. We all heard it here first. <laughs> But uh, so moving into the commentary role, um, as you said, you and I kind of started doing that pretty much around the same time. And you just put out a tweet the other day about it's been two years of you doing commentary and your confidence is where you need it to be. You feel like you've hit your stride. What, what has that whole process been like for you to now be sitting in that seat and feeling really solid there? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, it's, you know, I, I mean that statement in that I feel super excited to have kind of found the two coworkers that I jive with really well, you know, and this is not taking away from anyone else that ever worked with Morrow, Nigel, you know, Tom Phillips. I've, I've had great experiences and learned so much from everybody. You included Renee. We had lots of fun. I we think did that have fun. we had, a, we were we like, had to do the May Young classic together. Both of us were like, I, do you know what you're doing? I don't know what I'm doing, but no, 
it out. With Michael Cole <laughs> right in the middle. He must have just been like, oh my God. Yeah. But it was it was a fun experience. But I learned I learned so much, you know, with each little and and what I know is wrestling. I liken this a lot to wrestling. And I feel like when you're, you know, when you're wrestling in the beginning, especially like you take a little something from each opponent where you're like, oh, wow, I like the way they did that. Or, wow, that was, I learned a lot from that moment and having to think on my feet. And so I've taken so much from getting to work with, you know, the best of the best. Mm -hmm. So to to be in the point where I'm at now, where also I feel like I know the product so well, which was huge for me because coming into NXT, it's such a fast paced product. And, you know, I, I'm a kid of the eighties and nineties and I'm watching, you know, I'm watching, you know, slower paced matches and slower paced style. And so this is like, bah, 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 bah. And, you know, when I started, I came home to Adam and I said, man, I was crying. I was like, I can't keep up. I'm too old for this. I can't do it. And he was just like, you just don't know it. And they don't know you. And also all the feedback was so toxically bad. And like, you know, you suck and freaking like, just, you know, <laughs> I had to like, how was it? How did, you keep it out. That, how did you keep that out of your head? Because I had a tough time with that where I couldn't help myself because I felt that way as well. And they were echoing how I felt. So I couldn't help, but be like, you're right. I get it. That like, I, how did you move past that? Well, I, I remember texting you about it too, at times and being like, I, I don't, I can't do this. It's like, and if you don't believe in yourself, then you definitely can't do it. You know, it's like, it's sometimes when the whole world doesn't believe in you, you got to be the one that does in order to keep going forward. But, you know, I think that Michael Cole, I'll, I'll give him the credit on this. He was like, what you need is reps. Mm-hmm. And in those moments when everybody was saying, you suck. Like I swore, sorry, but oh, you know, when, swear when, all you want on here. We don't mind. When the feedback was just like, you suck. I just, I would just tell myself, Cole says, you just need reps. You need reps, reps, reps. So every time I was going to work, I was looking at like putting in time in the gym, yeah. Beth, you're not going to get a body overnight. You're not going to break your bench press overnight. You got to go put in the reps. And so like, that's, that's how I had to look at it when I wanted to cry and I wanted to quit. <laughs> Like I just was believing all the hate. I had to be like, you go in there and you do your freaking workout and you do your reps because one day you're going to break your bench press record. Damn right. And, and so, and that, and I put out that tweet the other day. Cause I just had fun at the desk. It was like the first time. And I told Vic this and I told Stu this, I had fun. And it's been, I've been waiting for that. I've been waiting to have the moment where I can sit down and the red lights on and I'm not a deer in headlights and terrified. And what am I going to say? And I just had fun because I felt safe with two people that, that elevate me. And I have great people on the headset that elevate me. And we just had fun. And I'm, who's I feel in, like I'm who's in your headset at NXT. Who's we've got Fathom, okay. Fathom and Palm Rico are with us. Got it. Got and, it. um, and Tom produces us. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I have, they're all friends and all people that I have a great deal of respect for. And they, and I just feel like it's a, it's a team. It's a real team effort. And I am all about being on a team. Like put me in, put me in coach. 100%, especially when you're in a situation like that. And I felt very much as, you know, as much as Cole did whatever he could to try to help me graves did what he could to help me. You start doing three hours of raw every week they have to worry about themselves. They didn't have time to worry about me. Yes. And I, I very much so felt like I was on my own Island. I was like, I just need someone to hold my hand a little bit, but it, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to get over that like hump. And the fact that you've been able to do that and you're in a comfortable spot and you, you put in the work, I mean, you put in work at absolutely everything that you do. And working at NXT is such a great spot for that as well, for you to be able to like, you can work and you've got the freedom in there to do what you do and to grow and to be better. And obviously that shows. Well, and, and, you know, I'm not trying to compare experiences, but this is, I don't know doing commentary on Ron Smackdown. So I can't speak to that. I know what I hear, but I don't know, but what I know, (laughs) (laughs) it comes with its own set of challenges and excitement. Mm-hmm. But at NXT, I know you, again, you hit the nail on the head. I was given the chance to grow. They didn't give up on me when the f- first six months, probably first year was super rocky. You know, they didn't like Hunter didn't, you know, if I would make a big mistake, it wasn't like she's done. You know what I mean? Right. Like he, Hunter, Hunter was, gave- Hunter's great with that. I will say like he would yes. send me texts sometimes. And like, those were the words of encouragement that I needed. Like, I was so happy that he had reached out to me times when he did. And I feel like when you, when you have somebody that's trying to nurture you like that, I feel like that, that motivates you to grow. 
You know what I mean? Like that motivates me like, okay, he didn't give up on me. So I can't give up on me. I got to bring my best effort because I have people that are trying to lift me up. So I don't want to come here and phone it in. Yeah. And so I feel like it's just been, it, NXT has been a great place. And I watched that happen with talent too, being, you know, given the chance to grow and try new things and take the handcuffs off and, you know, be able to pitch ideas and really get like a collaborative effort going on. And that, that's what I love about the NXT environment, you know, and um, yeah, we can all just get better. 100%. And you know, that was something that <clears throat> like, even me saying is like, I felt weird when I was doing commentary. I felt like I was, I couldn't get other people's voices out of my head. But then when I felt like people had given up on me, like there, I really, truly, like, I mean, I'll just say it here, but I felt like Vince had given up on me. <sighs> I could, I, you know, just that feeling. And maybe he, I don't know. And maybe it was just in my own head of me feeling that way that I always just felt very like, Oh, I felt very insecure about it the entire time. So every time I would walk back through gorilla, I'm like, Oh, I don't even want to look at anybody. I just want to like get in my car and go to the next town. But like, those were the things that would chip away at me and chip away at me that I'm like, Oh my gosh, I just need to like get out of this chair. Yeah. And, and I wanted, I wanted to make it work. I did really want to make that work and be successful more so not even for myself, but for laying that groundwork down for other women to jump in there. And as much as, you know, it, it was made a big deal for me to be the first uh, woman to call Monday night raw and WrestleMania and all that. I'm so happy that I was the woman that got to do that, but it should have been you. <laughs> yes. No, Renee. Yes. No, yes. no. Yes. And I will tell you why. Because at the right why. time. It, 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 yes. Anyway, no. go ahead. But I will say like, you know, you, what you can do, I could, and I could not then, and I could not now do. And, and you bring such an energy and a brightness to, and you also bring out the best in people. When I remember doing, we did the panel before evolution. Yeah. And that, you know, I remember we did, it was me, you and Paige. Yeah. And I just remember that again, like I have, I've done panels before and I'm so nervous and I'm like I'm trying to remember my pre-written out answers and, <laughs> you know, and then that was the first time where I feel like we had no time and Michael yes. Cole was like, throw away your notes. And we just sat down and the red light went on and like Renee just did Renee. And I was like, oh my God, I really like, I just saw the magic of being in that position. And the, the hardest thing in the world to do is to make your, make your guests feel comfortable so that you can bring out the best in them, especially in whether you don't have a rapport behind the scenes. You know sure. what I mean? Like a, talking to a friend might be a little bit easier, but a brand new person and you and I were friends, but not as close as we are now. Right. And I remember in that moment being like, wow, like that's, that's a skill set that I admire very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, that was the thing for me is like hosting panels and hosting shows and being able to do this where it's like, we can just chat and have a time. I love doing that. Talking in little sound bites and finding those right times and matches to talk is like, but, but what, like literally when Michael Cole and, and Hunter were like, you're going to step in and do Monday Night Raw. I was like, okay, great. And then I was like, wait, how do you do that? I never even <laughs> thought that that's, you know, talking in those sound bites and finding those right moments in like certain moments in a match. It is such a different skill. So like anyone that's in that commentary desk, I mean, I applaud them all damn day long. Oh yes. I have a lot of respect for everybody that does the yes. role. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, okay. So we've talked about how much the, the women's evolution obviously has grown, how much you've been able to grow as a broadcaster uh, when you're eventually going to put the boots back on. That's all going to happen. <laughs> Not what? if, what? when I like the way you when? did that Renee. <laughs> <laughs> when that happens, we'll all be ready. Glam slams all around. <laughs> Uh, what, what, what else do you want to see happen for women in, uh, in professional wrestling? Um, so I think that we are in a good pocket right now. I mean, I love, obviously we had such a celebration at WrestleMania. They, you know, the women were highlighted, like we've been waiting for them to be for a long time. And also again, like I say this all the time, it wouldn't work if the opportunities that, that we give the women, if they didn't like not just meet it, but exceed it. Like, I feel like to, yeah. to continue getting the opportunities for a long time, the women had to keep exceeding the expectations because we were like just working behind the eight ball. So I feel like something that I hear often from fans and, you know, and the chatter amongst the women, I think there is room now. And we've educated our audiences to see the women as stars where you might be able to do a weekly women's show. And it wouldn't, no offense to like low or previous all women's shows, but it wouldn't be so much gimmick. It would be wrestling. 
And I think you could have characters and interactions and personality, but you wouldn't have to have entirely, um, you know, just gimmicky flowery angles and a can-can line at the end. You know, I think you could have yeah. some, you could have entertainment and wrestling. You know, and you keep seeing, uh, I feel like each year after we did that evolution pay-per-view, there is that demand for, and, all, and just to keep having that all women's pay-per-view because there's so many bodies, there's so much talent. We have tag divisions. We've got, you know, multiple championships. It's like, let's get these women out in front of each other and let's let them get in the ring together and be able to like really showcase what they can do consistently time and time again. Let's bring it back. Yeah. And we have like, we have a need for content, a hunger and thirst for content, like never before. I mean, we have wrestling yeah. every day of the week like, between impact yeah. and AW, us, like, you know, there, there's so much wrestling. I feel like a women's show would be successful because consumers are asking for it. So I, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what side of the pond would, you know, be willing to do something like that. But I think that would open up a lot of doors for also for women who aren't working for one of the big companies, the big TV companies to have a place to like, Hey, I could come in and be, you know, have a, have a match with, you know, one of our big stars or something like that. And, yeah. and you know, you could get some other fa new faces on there featured and get more opportunities. So. <laughs> yeah. Let's champion it. Make it all happen. One Put it other thing there. I want to talk to you about commentary wise, because this blew my mind was during the peak of COVID craziness, you were calling NXT from home. How the yeah. hell did you do that? I mean, it was a village of people. It was a village. So what happened was over the summer, you know, Adam had the greatest mess wrestling match ever, right? The world's greatest wrestling match. Yep. And like my mom has heart conditions. She has a triple bypass. She's like super mega high risk. Okay. So pandemic happens. The news is saying the world is ending. And we're like, what is going on? So we had discussions with like, you know, I think they were work, working and talking to all talent and like, you know, who, who's comfortable doing what? And in my situation, I was like, I, I'm stuck guys. Like Adam's hurt. He just had a surgery. My kids aren't in school. We had, you know, my, my kids are remote schooling and I can't get COVID because I, my mom lives alone and I help her. So I was like, we were just, I was in this situation where I'm like, maybe I have to quit. Like maybe mm -hmm. I said to them, I said, if you have to replace me, I completely understand, but I'm stuck. I, you know, I got to take care of my husband. He, he's, he needs my help. My kids need me and my mom needs me. And, and Michael Cole and Hunter said, we're going to work. We're going to come up with something. And they, they got with tech and tech got with me and you know me, I can barely operate a cell phone. <laughs> My computer already died during this interview. I don't know what the hell is going on. It's magic that I can click a link to get on Zoom. And somehow with a army of WWE masterminds, we were able to set up a remote commentary station and they did so for Morrow as well because um, of travel restrictions too. Like in North, in North Carolina was locked down. I couldn't even get there if I wanted to. And 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 then we we did this progressively throughout the rest of the summer and the fall through Christmas. And, you know, that my, we were able to get my mother vaccinated in that time before I came back to work. You know, she was in the first or second high risk group, whatever the one was for high risk medical conditions. Okay. I can't remember which one it was, but um, we got her vaccinated and Adam was healed. So, you know, he didn't need my help anymore. And my kids returned to school. So my, my life was, I was in a position where I could travel again. And if I could expose myself to risk, because all, all my personal ducks were back in a row, but I I've said this to everybody, you know, individually, but I, I have an absolute gratitude and loyalty to, to NXT, to Hunter, to Cole, to everybody that made that happen and how hard it was to work with me because they had to put the other commentators on a delay. Like it was like, a, it was about 0.8 of a second in order to be able to match me because it was done like through Wi-Fi, right? Through the internet. So there would be one, two, three in the ring. You know how fast everything moves. One, two, three. They would have to call it and then, it, and then see it on the screen like half a second later. Replays. Everything was off. Oh so God. Yes, to the guys that were sitting at the desk, they were so good that they were working on a delay to, to operate in sync with me. It was unbelievable. I was so curious how you guys were doing that. Cause I remember I was watching one night and I was like, wait, why? I think it was Tom or it was Vic. They were there by themselves. And I was like, wait, hold on. 
what's happening mm-hmm. here? And I think I messaged whoever it was and they're like, yeah, like they're recording remotely from home. I was like, holy <laughs> to like rely on the Wi-Fi to work to you have the monitor to like, I mean, so much goes into even just when you're at the venue calling commentary, let alone doing it at home, no distractions, hoping that the quality is going to be okay. Like that's giving me an ulcer to even think about it. Oh, you know, like the, uh, there's like a new, like there's a real thing where people get anxiety from seeing the battery tick down on their phone, <laughs> like the Wi-Fi bars. Like I would wear like a tank top, do it sometimes. Cause I was sweating watching that Wi-Fi. like the live takeovers. Like I think I did three live takeovers like w- remotely. And I mean, cause that that's live action. And so if you're gone, you're just gone. Yeah. And so like, again, we always had to have somebody at the desk. So Tom Phillips, you know, never took a second off. He was at the desk. And sometimes Tom was calling with Morrow in LA and me in North Carolina. And he was live at the desk. So, I mean, I just, I can't give enough credit to everybody for doing that. And, and again, the reason everybody did that for me was because I, I had to put my family first. Mm-hmm. And so I, I also want to give credit to those folks. Cause you know, so much, so much flack during the pandemic for this and that, you know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. I want to bring forward like the good things and the good stories and people that helped each other. And, and in that moment, like they, they did everything for me. Crazy. That's, that's actually like a true miracle. I cannot believe that you guys, not once you did it for months. That's crazy. So kudos to everybody involved on that project. Yes. Yes. My Um, hair is totally gray. (laughs) Honestly, I'd be like stress eating during commercial breaks. Like I can't even imagine. It was bad. Um, So before I let you go, we've covered a plethora of topics. And one thing that I think I would be remiss to not ask you about is the key to making the best pierogi. You are the pierogi queen. Teach me. Teach me your ways. I I was like, Renee is going to ask me about this pierogi. And I want to tell this quick little story. Can I tell you a quick little story? Yeah. Because I want to give credibility to this advice that I'm going to give you. Other than I've made progress since I was a little girl, my grandmother made it. We would make it in church, like two dozen Polish ladies assembly line making these brogies. So anyways, I was picking up Adam from the airport one time and I was in the car listening to Martha Stewart radio and XM, the, the queen, give credit to the queen. Of course, so I'm waiting, right. So I'm waiting for Adam and the radio station says like, if you have a question for Martha, call in. I have never called into a radio station ever in my life. And I don't know why I was like, "Eh, I'll give it a call. And so I called thinking I'm going to go straight to like, you know, a a line or a queue or something. And then somebody picks up in one ring and goes, hi, this is Martha Stewart radio. Do you have a question? I said, yes, I do. I have a question. (laughs) And then he goes, okay, I'll patch you right through. And I was like, what like to Martha and he's like yeah so I I finally get through on the phone line and there's Martha Stewart with her soft vocal tones and she's like hi this is Martha do you have a question for me and like I didn't know I I obviously had this super awkward vocal tone but I just blurt out Martha how do you make the best pierogi dough knowing Martha Stewart is also a Polish lady like myself (laughs) so then Martha gives me the secret and she says very plainly she goes well the secret is sour cream And she said a tablespoon of sour cream in your pierogi dough will make the dough soft and keeps it from getting gummy. And so you can, because a lot of times with the dough, you, as you're cutting pieces and then taking the scraps and putting it back together, reassembling, uh, it can get sticky and gummy. Mm -hmm. So the sour cream keeps it nice and soft and velvety. Ah, see, I knew you were going to have a solid answer for that. Hell yes. So I have a pierogi recipe that's in my cookbook. That you must, I mean, next time you make pierogies, you may, maybe you can try it and tell me if it holds up or not. I'm chopping at the bit. I cannot wait. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen, I've seen your cooking. So I know, I know it's going to be great. Oh, I can't wait. All right, Beth, thank you so much for taking the time and joining me and getting to hang out and chat all things wrestling and now pierogies. And we'll just, uh, we'll await you um, getting in the ring. But in the meantime, we will enjoy your vocal stylings on commentary because you were absolutely crushing it. I could not be happier to see where you're at and just the leaps and bounds that you are making for women in broadcasting and wrestling. So thank you, Renee. I'm so happy for you to enter this new chapter and the little baby. I cannot wait. (laughs) I'm going to squish your little baby. You're going to pick your cheeks. Oh, I can't (laughs) wait. Sweet little thing. (laughs) Can't wait to meet her. 